1974. We're in St. Luke's Methodist Church at the School of Continuing Education. I'm doing an interview with Mr. H.K. Gaines. Mr. Gaines, to begin with, what does H.K. stand for? Howard Kennedy Gaines. And what do they call you? Well, I've been called a lot of things, but <laughs> most of the time in places where I'm pretty well known, they call me Gainesy. Gainesy. All right. Well, we'll just, we'll just call you Gainesy if that's, that's all right. right. Uh, uh, Gainesy, could you tell me when you're, about your family, who your parents were, and when they came to Oklahoma? Well, my parents were Mr. and Ms. William C. Gaines. Their parents, uh, William C. Gaines' parents, came from South Carolina to Texas in 1852. He was in a train of ox-pulled wagons. My mother's folks, Martha Ellen Combs, came from Alabama to Texas. These young folks formed a partnership in January 11th, 1888. I moved in with them in February the 5th, 1889. My early life in Texas was uneventful on a lot of the farms around Hunt County near Camel, Texas. In December of 1902, we came to Oklahoma. <clears throat> I herded cattle out nine miles west of Apache until June the 8th of 1903. Then we went to the Osage country, which was the Osage Reservation at that time, and it later became the Osage County. My first job was a line rider for W.K. Hale. The duty of a line rider was to go around the fences each day to see that they were not torn up and broken into by the cattle in their attempt to mingle with the cattle of other pastures. <coughs> <coughs> routine of the roundup, a routine of the work in the ranch rather, was rather carefree and about the same routine until time for the fall roundups in which these cattle were selected for shipping to the market. <clears throat> Fairfax was at the end of the railroad at that time. Before we go into this, why don't uh, you, you, uh, you said the routine generally was just about the same, but what was, what was your daily routine prior to the round? The daily routine was uh, riding the fence, or what they call the line rider, to keep up the fence make small repairs if necessary, and if the large break in the fence was made, I'd report that when I got back to the camp. What time did you get up in the morning? Got up, oh, about sun up or a little before. Didn't have to hurry too much. Did you, uh, did you work with a large group of people? Uh, there were about four of us in the same bunch. Did you live on the, did you live on the uh, ranch there? Yes, we lived there in, uh, there were no, no houses, but we lived in tents. Uh, did, uh, did you, how did you cook? Did you eat together? Did you have uh, No, we all ate together and cooked in, a, had a cook tent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Fairfax was the end of the railroad at that time, so we had to drive the cattle that were to be shipped either to Call City, Oklahoma, or Elgin, Kansas. <coughs> we shipped to such markets as Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, and other eastern markets. Guy Lombardo has spoken and boasted about having the sweetest music this side of heaven, but it's very evident that he never listened to a cowboy on night herd singing to quiet a bunch of restless cattle. The night herders were divided into two groups, half rode clockwise, the other half counterclockwise. This method kept them in very close contact with the herd. And it's rather uncanny to remember that about midnight, the cattle would begin to get up and stir around just a little bit. <clears throat> At roundup time, they depended on help from the nearby pastures or nearby cowboys. They made no charge for their help as all work was on an exchange basis. The 
range was wild and sometimes a little bit bad. But helping the other fellow was a simple and a friendly way of life on the range. <clears throat> Can you think of some of the special ways of helping the other person on the range? Well, most of the time in the, in the roundups, it would be necessary to have folks drive in the cattle from a large area of the plain, bring them into a group so they could be easier to pick out the ones they were going to ship to the market. At that time... Uh, let me ask you one other. I'm sorry to keep breaking in, but uh, I, there's one thing I think is very interesting. You talk about the songs. Uh, I may be putting you on the spot, but do you remember any of these songs? I remember the name of some of the songs. And Get Along Little Dogie, Red River Valley. That's about the only ones I can remember now. Were you pretty good at singing them? No, I'm not a singer. You're not. I scared the cattle instead of quieting. <laughs> it wouldn't be fair to mention anything about their life on the range if I left out something about the old chuck wagon. And it's surprising how much the folks enjoyed the good food that was cooked over the open fire. And I might mention that when uh, wood was not available, they used cow chips, which was commonly called surface coal. Did you get that? <laughs> Tell me this. I've often wondered uh, about that and never having used them. Uh, does it, uh, isn't there quite a smell there? Not too much because it's all dried and it just burns like wood. Makes a pretty hot fire all right. But... Uh, some people would kind of hesitate to eat anything that was cooked that way. I don't know why. It wouldn't make any difference. It didn't bother you, did it? Not a bit. It didn't. The menu was pretty much the same. It was usually roast beef, potatoes, and good old brown beans. And they had no tables or chairs. Folks had to sit on the ground or any other comfortable place they could find. The menu was very simple, but it satisfied the ravenous appetite of those punchers. <clears throat> the horses were fed shelled corn and morels. Now, a morel is uh, just a big, loose bag that was hung over the horse's nose. And it's surprising how well they could flip those morels up and get every bit of the... Uh, to get every bit of the grain. <clears throat> now, that, that <clears throat> at night, the horses were turned out in a little, what they call the horse trap, which was another name for a small pasture. One horse was kept staked out for the convenience of the wrangler. He was the fellow who had to drive up the horses, or the remuda, for the day's work. The ones that were to be uh, worked that day were saddled and ready for work. Now, do you want this list of the cowboys? Yeah. Here is a list of some of the cowpunchers I knew back in those days. John Morris and his brother, Buster Morris, Emmett Cadell and Ben Cadell, that's father and son, Rod Williams, Pitts Beatty, um, Henry and Tom Grammer, and uh, Ruth Allen, Ansel Sawyer, Frank Wooten. At one time, Henry Grammer was supposed to be, a, well, almost the world's champion bronc buster. But one day, I saw a horse throw him about as high as the bridle reins would let him go. <coughs> Did you know any of the any of the 101, uh, the 101 rodeo? 101. I have seen some of those fellows over there. Now speaking of the one, the 101 ranch, Will Pickett was a, a nigger cowboy and one of the best they had. I have seen him do his famous bulldogging stunt by throwing the steer by sliding down between his horns, gripping the steer's lips in his teeth. 
he'd rear back and he would throw the steer that way. And I have seen him do that dangerous stunt. And I have seen uh, Zach, Mo Zach Miller, who was the one who had the division of the, the cattle of the ranch. George Miller was the one who kind of looked after the farms. <clears throat> All cattle that shipped into the Osage had to be dipped in a solution of water and crude oil. The dipping vat was approximately three feet wide, about 40 feet long, and I would guess approximately eight, maybe 10 feet deep at the end where the cattle were pushed in. They gradually sloped up so they could walk out into the draining chute. A very amusing incident happened there one time while dipping the cattle. A cowboy from Texas by the name of Bailey fell in the vat. Naturally, he took a lot of teasing about having to be dipped to, cure, to kill the Texas ticks. He, he took it all in a very good nature, and everybody had fun teasing him. <clears throat> there were no houses, well, very few, I might say, but we had to live in tents which wasn't a bad way to live, except in rainy weather and leaky tent. In the winter of 1904 and 5, we lived in a tent, and the temperature really got down to the bottom of the thermometer. That was my first experience in living in real air conditioning. And it was awfully cold and disagreeable to live in a tent with no fire at all. The only fire we had was in a small log cabin where the cooking was done over an old wood-burning cook stove. <clears throat> a new world was opened to me in the fall of 1907, and I was shown a better way of life by Mr. J.J. Quarles, who was cashier of the Osage Bank at Fairfax. I was just about as green as the pastures I rode, but Evidently, Mr. Quarles saw some place where I might improve or it would be better for life for me. He needed someone to work in the Osage Bank to take the place of his son, Frank, who had moved on to the First National Bank in Pahuska. <coughs> Before going any further, I believe it, I should speak a few words of appreciation and praise to Mr. J.J. J. Quarles. He was a wonderful man, well-known and well-liked by everybody, and especially the Indians. He spoke their language fluently. And to show their appreciation and friendship for him, they gave him the Indian name Posse which meant yellow nose. When Mr. Quarles died, a large group of his old-time Indian friends gathered around the grave and wailed in their tribal wailing for the dead for several days. The bank work was very interesting and educational to me. Mr. Quarles patiently taught me as much about bookkeeping as I was able to understand. I came in contact with a number of Indians in the bank, and most of them, or a lot of them rather, spoke very good English, but they preferred to use their own language. They would come in sometimes with a 10 or $20 bill. They wanted change. The way they would ask for it, Wahota Monsaska Cambre which literally meant little money want. Sometimes they'd come in with silver and want to change it for a bill. Then they would say, Tainanka Masuske, Cambre, which meant paper money wanted. Now the after... While we're on banks, uh, why don't you talk a little about the differences in the operation of a bank at that time, bookkeeping and that sort of thing uh, from uh, procedures today. 
Well, to start out on the bookkeeping job, I didn't have much equipment except an old straight pen and a bottle of ink. Didn't even have an adding machine. Had the old Boston Ledger, which was well known by that time, but it's discontinued now, for the loose leaf system. The Boston Ledger was a large book, blank book, with columns for each of the days. And it was necessary to make all of the entries, debits and credits, and extend each balance and then add the whole thing, if I could, by my head. <coughs> What about uh, what about when you had uh, problems of getting off balance? Can you discuss uh, can you discuss that? Getting off balance has always been a very tiring process for anybody who keeps books, and it was a long, tedious job. And I didn't know the shortcuts for finding the amount that was out. I just had to re-add and keep working at it. But now there is a different way of detecting the especially. Transpositions. Divide the transposition by nine, and the difference will be the amount between the two numbers, which, when transposed, will be the amount you're out of balance. And that's a big help to know which ones to look for. Anything else? Uh, that's fine. Does anyone have any questions on the bank? That's very good. Where did you get your Where did you get your backgrounding for bank work? I didn't have any background. I was just pulled in out of the green grass of the pastures, and Mr. Quarles taught me as much as he could about the bookkeeping. I didn't know. I didn't know it. She moved into an area that I was going to swing back into uh, later when I had the chance because you completely we we skipped over your early education. I think this I would be. I didn't have any early education. Did you have any schooling at all? Very little. Where, where was it? Well, in just small country schools around in Texas and Oklahoma. How much did you have? Well, I finally got up to about the eighth grade. But it was um, very hard for me to, to take over any part of the work in the bank. I just didn't know anything. I might mention that back in the early days, if you let me just kind of skip away from the real English, I would say that I was so ignorant that the instructors couldn't teach me anything. They just had to learn it to me. <laughs> I know that is not it's very poor English, but that, that gives you the idea of how ignorant I was at that time, and I'm not too far along now. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Mr. and Ms. Quarles very graciously took me into their home, and I was treated as another member of their family. And in return for their kindness, I took care of their horses and the cow. I did the milking. And <clears throat> I worked in the bank six months without any pay, and then my first salary was $10 a month. And after working in the bank for two years, I realized that with my very limited education, I could never compete with the business world. So in the fall of 1909, I borrowed money from two of my friends and went to Tonkawa, Tonkawa, Oklahoma. <clears throat> Fortunately, it was not necessary to take an entrance examination to get into the school, and I enrolled in the University Preparatory School, which was better known as the UPS. I specialized in English, shorthand, and typewriting. <clears throat> Early in the June of 1910, Mr. Robert Dunlop of Newkirk, Oklahoma, who was a candidate for a state treasurer, called down to the school and asked for someone who could take care of his business and handle the affairs of his office while he was out campaigning over the state. 
May I, uh, may I break in here? I'd, I'd like to get a little bit more on uh, the school at Takawa. Was that, uh, was that the school, did that later become the Takawa Junior College, the Northern Oklahoma Junior College? And that was later the Northern College, I believe. Northern Oklahoma Junior College. Yeah, the Oklahoma Junior College. But at that time, it was known as a UPS, which is University Preparatory School. There were approximately 300 uh, students in there. We all knew the teachers, and they knew us. Fortunately, I had a wonderful English teacher. He knew English, and he knew how to teach it in such manner that we would understand it. And uh, now I might mention that my first typing was done on an old blind Remington. That's what they call the blind. The keys came up and hit the platen on the underside. And to see where we had typed or made mistakes, we had to raise the carriage. And we also had the old Smith Premier, which was a double keyboard typewriter. It reached uh, way up to the top for the capital letters, and the small ones were down closer in range. And I had a wonderful shorthand teacher, Miss Vara E. Cass, C-A-S-S. -S. She was very patient with us because we didn't know anything anyway, and she taught us how to write the pen, the... I forgot. Oh, the Pittman system of shorthand. That's one of the hardest systems that's ever made. Now I understand that most schools, they have the Gregg system. The, can you describe the campus at, at uh, UPS? The campus was very small then, and they had only three buildings, I might say. And it was very, very nice. Lots of trees, but it, it was small. They had only three buildings. But I understand now, that is, from the last time I was up there, they had about a dozen buildings, and I couldn't get around without a road map and a guide. Is it the same area? Same place. Now. Uh, where and did you live there? I lived at Fairfax. And then we went to school. There were a bunch of us that went to, to Tonka Wall. And I was up there in 1970 when they had the reunion of the class of 1920. When I went in to uh, sign for the Times, I asked if they had a special place for the old and relics of 1910. My diploma was dated in 1910, and I found two of the former schoolmates there. One was uh, Miss, uh, at that time, she was Miss Jenny Payne. She was in the shorthand and typing class. And there was another fellow who was in a math class, I believe, but I've forgotten his name, but those were the two I found of my former friends there in 1910. Now, I will go back and speak a little bit more about the Tonka Wall, the, the preparation for our classes there. Tonka Wall School was a wonderful place. And I have never known any of the students who didn't make good in whatever profession they chose. They were very thorough in it, in their training there. <coughs> now, shall I go back to 19... Yes, <coughs> I will go back and tell something about my work with uh, Mr. Dunlop, who was... Made, he was successful in his campaign he was elected to state treasurer in the 1910. I asked him for a job, and he accepted me to do the stenographic work in the state treasurer's office. I worked there until August of 1914. Then in, Can you talk a little about the operation of the treasurer's office at that time? The treasurer's office at that time was a very small group, six of us in there. And I understand there's a house full now. I don't know just how many or what they do. But there were only six, and we had plenty to do. And uh, it was very convenient, very congenial bunch to work with. Do you want to know who any of them yeah. are? The chief clerk in the office at that time was Sanford Brooks, whose brother was William A. Brooks. It used to be here in the bond purchasing department. The bookkeeper was G.E. Metz, 
M-E-T-Z. He had formerly lived at Newkirk. The warrant clerk, the one who registered all the warrants for the state, who came in was Alex Savage. He was from down in the southwest part of the state. The security man was uh, Charlie Howe, H-O-W-E, and he was from uh, Sayre or Elk City. I have forgotten just which one. And I did the stenographic work, and that was a pretty big job most of the time. What time, time were you using then? At that time, they had an old um, Remington, but I preferred the Underwood, so I bought my own machine, an old second-hand machine, and I think I paid $20 for it. And uh, in August, now you want to find out? In August of 1914, I started to work in the accounting department of the Oklahoma City branch of the Ford Motor Company which was on West, uh, second, oh, West First Street, where the building and loan company is now. I worked in practically every, off every job in the office, but the main one was bookkeeping. I stayed with the Ford Motor Company from 1914 to 1935, With the exception of a little more than nine months, which I spent in the United States Navy during World War I. Uh, yes, uh, on the Ford Motor Company, were you here when the factory was here? I was here before they built this factory out there. Why don't you tell everything that you can recall about the, the, the coming of the factory here? I think it was about 1915, they put up the new building out 900 West Main. And then on uh, Easter Sunday of 1915, we moved the office from West uh, First Street out to the present building of the Ford Motor Company. The, uh, did you, uh, did you knew Fred Jones, I'm sure. I knew Fred Jones when he started to work out there as a clerk on the assembly line. He was uh, very efficient in his work there, friendly, got along with everybody just real well. He went from there to Blackwell, which was the Jones, uh, well, I've forgotten the name of the fellow he went in with, but that was his beginning as an agent for the Ford Motor Company. He was there for two or three years, and then he came down, formed his own company, and operated by himself as a Fred Jones Motor Company. Oh, the fellow he went in with at, Tonk at uh, Blackwell was Rice. It was the Rice Jones Company. Tell a little about the manufacturing operation that they had here, what, uh, what all they did, and what, uh, how an assembly line operated at that time. The assembly line was the operation of putting all of the different parts of the cars together. The, the company shipped in the different parts from Detroit. They were assembled together and then put in to form the car. They would start in with just the chassis, which was the assembly of the frame that went on the car. Then they would add a little bit to it as the, the line moved on down. When they got to the end of the line, which was, uh, oh, I would say approximately 100, maybe 150 feet, the car rolled off under its own power. The, uh, all the part, did they structure any of the parts here, or did all the parts come in by shipment? All parts were shipped in from Detroit, and they were put together here, or assembled in the different parts of the car. Who was the manager here? The first manager they had was R.E. Davis. He kind of got a little bit up or off line there, and one of the home office auditors fired him. 
Then John Dagnan, J.A. Dagnan came in as a manager. He was well liked by everybody. He stayed there until, must have been about 1916, when he went into business for himself. And uh, H. Clay Dawes was the next manager who came in. He was well liked by everybody, the agents and all the employees who worked with him. He knew how to get along with people. And he was there for uh, several years. Finally, he was given a better job. He was given a very important job with the home office, which was in Detroit at that time. Then the next manager who came in was uh, Ed Basket from Philadelphia. He didn't get along quite so well with some of the folks, and when he came in, he decided that it was necessary. That was in 1935, right in the beginning of the Depression, and Mr. Basket came here at the beginning of the Depression, and part of his job was to fire the heads of the department who had been with him for a considerable length of time. Unfortunately, I was one of them because I was head of the accounting department. And they fired uh, anyone who had been there any length of time and who was getting a pretty good salary. I was replaced by a fellow from uh, Houston, I believe it was, for approximately half what I was drawing in the salary. This was what year? What year was that? I was with the Ford Motor Company. What year? Well, that was 1935. Yeah, 1935, that was the beginning of the Depression. And when I was fired, it was pretty hard to find a job. And for the first year, I spent most of my time interviewing places where I thought there might be a chance to get a job. But they, I would, after I would give them my experience and all, they would say, well, you seem to have plenty of experience, qualified for the job, but we'd like to have a younger fellow. We could train him our own way. So that's old age got me. How old were you then? Well, let's see, in 35, I must have been about uh, 40. Well, I was a little past 40, but we didn't use that as a figure. And when I was let out, I, I finally got a job, and I worked for various accounting departments and several firms around over Oklahoma City until March of 1944. Who were some of them? Oh, some of the places. I worked for an accounting company here. I was with the Harbor Longmire Company for about seven years. And, oh, let's see. I'm trying to think of the name of that accounting company. I worked yeah. with the public accounting. But I can't think well, of it. Yeah. In March of 1944, I started to work for my good Masonic friend, Fred F. Fox, and I was the accounting department until 1967, January 31st, when I resigned. Because I figured that I'd better get out and kind of enjoy a little bit of life before it was too late. Now, I like Oklahoma, and I like the friendly people who live here. It's a pleasure to turn back the pages of time to some of those early days and remember the good times that I had. Those days can never come back, but I can relive them in those old faded memories that are mellowed with the passing of years. 
Let me ask you a few questions. Let's talk about entertainment back in the early days. What did you do, uh, say, in the, 19, in the teens? What were some of the entertainment places that you would uh, go to in Oklahoma City? Well, the old first one, I guess, was the Metropolitan Theater, which was uh, out on Main, no, it was on Grand. Metropolitan was the old Met. The Overholzer Theater was down in there. Well, now, one of the best shows I saw was The American Woman. That was uh, a wonderful show. And uh, Fields Minstrel was another good one. But we, everybody enjoyed that. Now, wait a minute. I can't think of that. That's all right. Why don't you describe, we're, we're running short on time, so I want to keep it moving. Why don't you talk about the Overholz Opera House, what it looked like? Well, the Opera House was a wonderful place. It was a big two-story, and they had a high balcony, and musical plays came in there. And, oh, and there was another one down on there, the, uh, well, I better not try to, the Orpheum, yeah, that was one, and uh, several vaudeville houses. And it was all oh, very nice place for entertainment, and it was cheap enough that we could go in for about oh maybe a dollar for the show. There were more stage shows then. They had stage shows, and a lot of the people who were traveling around were they were pretty friendly sort of folks. Now the overalls or opera house became an Orpheum theater. Isn't that right? I think it was later changed to the Orpheum. And another big thing that we enjoyed very much was going up on the Concord building, because that was the top of the world at that time. We could go up there and see all over town. And there wasn't much town then. Tell about the building, but there was a big building boom there about 19, were you here in 1909 and 10? 1909 and 10, no, I didn't come, I didn't come here until 19, 1911. I see, yeah, which is about when the Concord building was brand new. Yes, it was a new one at that time. And one of the prettiest buildings that Oklahoma City has ever had was the old bomb building, which they have destroyed now. It was a replica of um, a building in, uh, um, in Italy, yeah. But I've forgotten the name of it. But uh, it was a wonderful building. Back in the time, oh, say, before 1920, what was the most exciting event that you remember in Oklahoma City? Well, it wasn't anything very exciting about that time. Oh, I guess I might mention the, the hobbled skirts that the girls wore. And the bad boys would go down on the corner and watch the girls get on the streetcars. Did you? I did. <laughs> No, oh, those were the days when the streetcars were in and all around. That was a way of transportation. Yeah. Yes. Tell about the floods of 19, particular 1923. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. They flooded the zoo out and had to move it. Oh, that that was when they yeah, along about 1923 or four they had the the big rains down there, and the river, North Canadian River, got up and practically washed all of the zoo at, uh, well, now, wait a minute, I forgot. Yeah, yeah but I forgot the name of that park down there. Yeah, Wheeler park. At Wheeler Park. I'm losing my memory on a lot of these old things that I haven't thought of in so long. Tell about old Belle Isle Park. Oh, that Belle Isle, that was a wonderful place. We used to go out there and we'd go swimming, and there was a dance hall out there. Belle Isle was a wonderful place then, and, and everybody seemed to go out on Sunday. We'd go boat riding and swimming, dancing, and that was the main part of our entertainment. Now let's discuss Wheeler Park a little bit. Wheeler Park was an interesting place to go because we could look around there at some of the animals and they enjoyed looking at us and 
kind of broke things even. Now, what was this other place out here? Uh, there's another park out here. I can't think of Northeast that. Park. No, it is out here on Classen. Oh, uh, Memorial. Uh, no. Putnam Park. Putnam Park. No. Well, I can't think of the name of that other park out there, but that was before they had Belle Isle. Putnam Park was up where Kinder Park is now. Now, well, I've forgotten that name out there. What about, uh, did, did you remember the uh, Delmar Gardens? Oh, right? Delmar Gardens, I think, was uh, practically moved before I came here. But I know it used to be the place which later became the Wheeler Park. They moved that up there, close to pretty close up there. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the... Uh, uh, oh, what, what about, the, did you frequent the nightclubs? No, I did not. <laughs> they didn't have the nightclubs in that I was interested in. Tell me, uh, you, you've not talked about the family. Do you have any family or did you have any family? I didn't at that time, but uh, now in <clears throat> 1922, I was in a... Well, I better go back. Can you erase that sure. part? Yes, go ahead. All right. I was in a boarding house where I met a very friendly lady from Boston. And she said she had a very good friend that she thought I might like to meet. It was Miss Geraldine Smith at uh, 122 Northeast 12th. And I liked Ms. Bither's friend from the time we first met, and I made arrangements to keep going out there. And in December the 24th of 1922, we were married. And we have two wonderful girls one of them lives in Tulsa. The other one lives in Redlands, California. We don't get to see them very often, but we have uh, occasions that we get together. Last uh, August, our girl from Redlands came and the other one from Tulsa, and we had sort of a family reunion and a wonderful time. The, uh, can you talk about the We've talked about the, the, the what about the building of the uh, Lincoln Park area? It used to be Northeast and now Lincoln. Do you recall anything about it in the 1920s? No, I don't remember much about that. But I remember when the Capitol was built. Would you like to? Yes, All right. Between the uh, 13th and the Capitol building, we went through a cornfield. It was just wide open space in there. And uh, the Capitol was quite an event then. We get to go out and go through the Capitol. We thought that was a wonderful place to see and we went out on a streetcar. How about the coming of oil here? The first one that I remember that amounted to very much was the Mary Sudic well that blew out of control out north, no, out east of town. It just sprayed oil everywhere here. That must have been about 1920, 21 or two, somewhere along there. No, 23, somewhere. But that was, they called it the Wild Mary Sudic. It was a well that blew out. And that was a wonderful event. When they had the oil here. Looks like our time is about up. Uh.